This algebraic geometry video will be about toric varieties, which give um, an easy way to construct several examples of projective varieties. So um, start, we'll start with an example of how to construct affine varieties from cones. Um, I will do the two-dimensional case as an example. Let's take the ring generated by x, x to the minus 1, y, and y to the minus 1. So this is a coordinate ring of k star times k star, where this is the variety of non-zero points in k. Well, strictly speaking, the non-zero points in k don't form an algebraic set, but we can think of them as being the points on a hyperbola or something like that. So it's convenient to think of them as being the non-zero elements of k. And I'm going to draw a picture of this ring by drawing a point for each monomial. So what happens is I get a sort of lattice like this, and the various monomials are 1, x, x squared, and then we get y, y squared, xy, and of course down here we get y to the minus 1, x to the minus 1, and so on. So each point of this square lattice corresponds to some monomial of this ring. And now I can define subrings just by drawing cones like this. So here is an orange cone. And I'm going to take the subring generated by all monomials in this orange cone. And it's pretty obvious what that is. This is just going to be the polynomial kxy. So that wasn't a very exciting example. Let's try another one. Suppose I take um, this green cone. Then this is going to be all polynomials in x and x, y to the minus 1. Well, this is just isomorphic to k, x, z, where z is equal to x, y to the minus 1. So again, this, this cone just gives us a polynomial ring in two variables. Now, let's try this cone here. Well, it looks at first sight as if this is going to give us yet another example, but um, something different happens because um, you see, if we take these points, they correspond to x, y to the minus 1 and x to the minus 1, y to the minus 1. If we take these two monomials here, they do not generate all points in the cone. They don't generate the monomial y. So here we're now getting the ring k x, y to the minus 1, y to the minus 1, x to the minus 1, y to the minus 1. Um, and let's try and identify this as an abstract ring. Well, let's write this as k. Let's call this element a, this element b, and this element c. Well, there must be some relations between a, b, and c. In fact, you can easily see that b squared is equal to a, c. So we should quotient out by the ideal generated by b squared minus ac. And the set of points in three space where b squared equals ac, it's quite easy to sketch. It just forms a sort of double cone with a singularity at the origin. So um, whenever you take a subring given by a cone, the subring has the following properties. First of all, it's an algebra over k. Secondly, it has no nilpotent elements, which is obvious because it's just a subring of the um, of this ring here. Um, thirdly, it's sometimes finitely generated. Well. Um, Turns out it's finitely generated if the cone is rational, meaning in the two-dimensional case that its edges pass through a rational point. If you take a cone with an irrational edge, it's not too difficult to see it. In fact, it's not finitely generated. Um, it still gives you an algebra, but it's not a finitely generated algebra. 
so it doesn't correspond to an affine variety so if it's finitely generated then what we get is the coordinate ring of an affine variety and it's easy to see what the affine variety is in these simple cases in this case this orange cone corresponds to the variety a squared in this green case it again corresponds to a squared even though it looks smaller and in this case it corresponds to a cone a double cone whatever um, even though this right angle quadrant looks superficially like this right angle quadrant so um we get a map from rational coat but we get an affine variety associated to every rational cone now let's look at what happens um, to varieties associated with various cones so suppose i take two cones let me take an orange cone and a bigger red cone and we can ask what is the relation between the corresponding varieties well obviously we get a map from the orange ring to the red ring in fact it's a sub ring of the red ring well um, we now run into a rather annoying problem which is that if you've got a map from a coordinate ring to another coordinate ring the map between corresponding varieties goes in the opposite direction so we get a map from the red variety to the orange variety and this is kind of annoying because we've got a map from the orange cone to the red cone but instead we get a map from the red variety to the orange variety which is the wrong way around and very annoying and confusing so we can get round this as um, by using duality so if we take a lattice z squared we can take its dual lattice Well, the dual of z squared, of course, looks rather like z squared. And now, if we take any cone in z squared, such as this cone here, we can now look at the dual cone, which consists of all um, points in the dual of z squared that, it, that, that are positive on this cone here. So the dual cone of this will now look something like this. And now, um, if, if a cone is contained in another cone, the, 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 the dual cone of the first one will actually be bigger than the dual cone of the second. So by taking duals, we sort of reverse direction of morphisms. So the idea is, um, instead of associating a variety to a cone, we associate a variety by taking the, the, the ring associated to its dual cone. So what we're doing is for each cone in Z squared, look at the dual cone and take the corresponding ring. So, um, and um, if, if we call this cone C, so this gives a variety of the cone C. So let's just see what happens in a couple of cases. So suppose we take um, so suppose we take a cone to be a sort of degenerate cone. So I'm just going to take a, a cone to consist of, of a single line. And we can ask what is the dual cone? Well the dual cone is now the dual of this line which is in fact an entire half plane and the coordinate ring of this will be the ring um, k 
x, x to the minus 1, y, which corresponds to the non-zero elements of k times k. So a single line corresponds to the variety k star times k. Um, on the other hand, if we take a quadrant like this, then the dual of this quadrant will again be the same quadrant. And this just corresponds to the ring kxy, which corresponds to an affine plane. So the quadrant corresponds to the plane k times k. And now you can see that k star times k is a sub-variety of k times k. Um, and at the same time, the cone is a subcone of this blue cone here. So by taking associating varieties to dual cones, we get the same relation between cones as between varieties, which makes it a lot easier to figure out what's going on. Well, now, I mean, instead of looking at just one or two cones, we can look at several cones. So what we can do now is take several cones like this. Let me first do a one-dimensional case. So I'm just going to take one-dimensional case, and I'm going to take some cones. So I'm going to take a red cone, which is just going to be a line, and a blue cone, which I'll take to be the opposite line, and I will take their intersection, which is a green cone, and just corresponds to a point. And now I should look at the dual cones and see what's going on. So um, the dual of the red cone is uh, pretty obvious. It's just um, this line here. And the dual of the blue cone is again just this. And the dual of the green cone now becomes the whole line. And we can work out what the varieties are corresponding to this. So the red cone, k of x, just corresponds to an affine line. The blue cone, again, is another affine line. But now the green cone corresponds to k x, x to the minus 1 which is um, a1 minus a point. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these three varieties. So I've got two copies of a1 and a1, and they both contain a copy of a1 minus naught. And now I'm going to glue them together. So the picture is I've got a red variety here, which is a copy of a1. And I've got a blue variety here, which is another copy of A1. So, so this is an A1, and this is another A1. And they're glued together along this green subvariety, which is a copy of A1 minus the origin. Well, what do we get? Well, it's not very difficult to figure out what you get. What you get by doing this is just a copy of the projective line P1. So in other words, we can picture P1 as being the union of two copies of A1 glued along a copy of A1 minus a point by drawing this picture here. So, so this green one is the A1 minus a point, and this red one is, corresponds to the A1, and this blue one corresponds to A1. Well, of course, in one dimension, that's not terribly exciting. Um, in two dimensions, you have a lot more room to do things. So let's see what we get. Well, first of all, let's try um, the most obvious thing we can do and just take four quadrants. I'm going to take a green quadrant, um, a red quadrant, blue quadrant and some other color quadrant. Let me take a purple quadrant. So what we end up with is, is four varieties, each isomorphic to A2. Um, 
an A2 there, and there's an A2 there. And we're gluing them along these various sub varieties. So what does this correspond to? Well, this one corresponds to um, an A2 minus a copy of A1. It's essentially just A1 times um, A1 minus the, minus the origin. Um, well, what are we getting? Well, it's not too difficult to see. This picture is really a product of two copies of the picture we had on the previous piece of paper. And so if you take all these copies of A2 and glue them together, what we get is not P2, as you might guess, but P1 times P1. So this is a picture of the projective line times the projective line as a, uh, it's called, a, the varieties we get like this are sometimes called toric varieties. So P1 times P1 as a toric variety is drawn like this. Well, how do you get P2? Well, we can get to the projective plane P2 like this. So I'm going to take um, a copy of P1 here. And then I'm going to take um, another, sorry, this isn't a copy of P1, it's a copy of um, A2. And then I'm going to take this red cone here. And what does this correspond to? Well, we take a quick look at what its dual cone is. So the, the dual cone of this red cone will essentially be this thing here, which as we saw earlier, is just a polynomial ring in two variables and corresponds to A2. So, so this cone here gives us a copy of A2. And finally, we can take a blue cone here, which of course gives us yet another copy of A2. So we now have three copies of A2, and they're glued along. These three P two because P two is a copy of three copies of a of the affine line glued along copies of a one. Um, well, we can do other things. For example, we can take the following cone. Let's take um, a cone here, a cone here, a cone here. Cone here and a cone here. So this has got by gluing together five copies of A2 along something or other. So what's this? Well, you can go and figure it out for yourself. Um, well, we can do even more exotic things. For example, Suppose I take a cone that looks like this, and then I take another cone that looks something like this, and then I take another cone that looks something like this, and I take another cone looking something like this, as you can see, what I can do is I can take an infinite sequence of cones and I can glue together a lot of copies of two-dimensional affine space according to this infinite sequence of cones. And the question is, what projective variety do I get from that? 
And the answer is I don't get a projective variety. The variety is too big to be projective. In fact, it's not quasi-compact and all projective varieties or open subsets of them are always quasi-compact. So what this gives is an abstract variety. Um, variety. Obviously, if I have a finite number of rational cones, then I get a projective variety, but it's not all that difficult to check this. Um, so the sort of varieties you get like this are called toric varieties. The reason is that they all contain a torus as a dense subvariety. So first of all, I'll explain why that is so, and then I'll explain why a torus is called a torus. So if I take any um, collection of cones like this, um, we notice I can just look at this single point here, and the single point will sort of be contained in all these. So the variety of this point will map to um, whatever abstract variety I've got here. Now, the variety of a point, to get the variety of a point, we take its dual cone, which is just the whole space. And the whole space corresponds to the ring kx, x to the minus 1, y, y to the minus 1, at least in two dimensions. And this thing is the coordinate ring of a torus. So I'd now better explain why this is called a torus. So in algebraic topology, we know what a torus is. It's something that looks like this. So it's S1 times S1. And more generally, the product of any number of copies of S1 is also called a torus. Well, um, let's try doing this in algebraic geometry. So we can form S1 over the reals. So S1 over the reals is going to be the set of points with x squared plus y squared equals 1. Um, so what happens over the complex numbers? Well, over the complex numbers, this looks like x plus iy times x minus iy equals 1. And by changing variable, we can just say z1 times z2 equals 1. This is just a hyperbola which over the complex numbers is isomorphic to the complex numbers with the origin removed. Just map Z1 can be any non-zero complex number. So in other words, we can think of the non-zero complex numbers as being a sort of analog of the circle S1 over the reals. So the circle over the reals corresponds to the non-zero complex numbers. Um, over the complex numbers. So more generally over the complex numbers, we can call the product of any number of copies of C star a torus, in the same way that the product of any number of copies of S1 over the reals is called a torus. Um, in the theory of algebraic groups, um, a torus of this form, a product of copies of the non-zero complex numbers, play, plays the same role that an ordinary torus plays in the theory of compact Lie groups, which is another reason for calling these both toruses. Um, so um, that's what a toric variety is. It's something you can you can write down amazingly complicated toric varieties just by drawing pictures of several cones in n-dimensional space, and they all have um, a torus like this as some sort of dense subs subset.